post office definitely yes so they submitted something to the law commission which was supporting the repeal of this the cert- certification scheme that previously existed i think if anyone ever says that computers are infallible um then that's definitely something to raise a, a red flag about but then what can we do about it so can we um change this uh, presumption of correctness of computer evidence. I think probably we should, but what should it be replaced by? I think that's not so clear. And then the, the other challenge is how do we build more technical expertise within the legal profession? Not necessarily to answer all these questions, but at least knowing when to stop and then bring in experts. The problem is that being good enough for a business does not mean good enough to prosecute people or even good enough to uh, use as evidence in civil trials. And I think that's a, the mistake. So uh, often a computer system is considered good enough and analysed to be good enough for one business purpose. And then that is taken to mean that it's now beyond question when it comes to legal disputes. There have been other cases that I haven't been involved in but seemed reported when it does seem that the court system is very dismissive of people saying that computers have problems, even when uh, looking at the evidence, it was very likely that a computer problem contributed to to this case. Even the smallest, simplest program is inevitably going to have bugs. Uh, The hard part is identifying which bugs are going to be relevant uh, and which bugs are are not going to be relevant. Most are probably not, but but some are. If someone had access to this privileged access, um, which is used for fixing problems, then that would be a far more effective way about of taking money out of the system than the access that the sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses is given. The the court system doesn't seem to understand how computers work. (laughs) So my background's computer security research. And so I work in University College London in the Information Security Research Group. And yes, yeah, Professor of Security Engineering. And I do a variety of different topics of research within information security, but a common thread is payment system security or banking security. And that's really the area where I've had most interaction with the justice system by acting as an expert witness for people who often have lost some money and they're not sure who's to blame or often um, they think that the the bank should take more responsibility than they actually do. And so that was my first interaction with the justice system. And now I've got uh, interested in the the post office trial and I see a lot of analogies between the treatment of the sub postmasters and the treatment of some banking customers. So thinking about the post office scandal particularly, what would you... um be thinking about when you when you look at this problem in terms of the post office and Fujitsu and the relationship between those two big businesses really what what's their responsibilities to each other and to the users of their the software yeah so this is it's quite a complicated question because uh, like Fujitsu and Fujitsu subcontractors um, like Asher um, are don't really have any legal responsibility to the individual users of the systems that they are building. Um, It's the sub postmasters who are using it, but they really only deal with the the post office. And one of the problems that seems to have come up is that different parties have blamed um, other parties. Um, So the post office has said it's Fujitsu's fault and Fujitsu are being very quiet, but maybe they think it's the post office's responsibility. But overall, I think it's the the post office who deals with the sub postmasters and needs to assure themselves that the sub postmasters are being properly treated. And sometimes that might require them to ask some hard questions of Fujitsu and get the right answers. And sometimes it might just be accepting that computer systems are do fail and this is inevitable. And then ensuring that the people who lose out are not the sub postmasters. Um, they are the people who are in the worst position to deal with the losses and they are also in the worst position to actually fix anything and so 
they should not be the one taking the responsibility for the fraud, financial responsibility, and they certainly shouldn't be prosecuted for um, crimes which um, they certainly didn't commit. And probably, actually, the losses that sub postmasters were being prosecuted for were just um, fictions of the computer. No money was lost at all. So if you have a situation where Fujitsu people are able to directly access the terminals of sub postmasters and maybe alter what's what's seen by the sub postmasters without the sub postmasters even necessarily being aware of that that still remains the responsibility of the post office to manage that interaction would you say yes yeah it certainly should be in the interest of fairness the the post office limited is the company that should be taking responsibility for for all of these issues now one of the uh, topics that came up in the trial, the Horizon trial, relatively early on, is that the contract between Post Office Limited and the sub postmasters is very unfair. So, from a legal basis, that's a, a a difficult question. But from a moral and ethical basis, I think it's clear that the Post Office has the responsibility for ensuring that the system is working as it should, and also that it's not being maliciously ac- maliciously accessed by anyone else, including by Fujitsu employees. Now, it's inevitable that there's all these ways of accessing systems. Um, When the post office said that this sort of system was not going to actually be um, possible to um, modify, then that was quite surprising because when you build a system, you always put in these extra ways of accessing it to fix problems, to do backups, to recover from backups, and so on. All you can do is um, ensure yourself that access to this is sufficiently well controlled and that sufficiently well logged and audited so that nothing bad happens. But these sorts of facilities are almost inevitably built into any modern system. So you'd think that there probably would automatically be some way in which people could know who was using privileged access to access a particular sub-postmaster's account? And to know what they'd done, I mean, that would be the normal thing to have that kind of record. Yeah, so privileged access must exist um, for a system to be usable. And then there certainly should be controls to limit who can access the system, um, controls over what they can do, and then uh, logs kept of what they're doing, and then audit processes to make sure that this is all above board. Now, what seems to have happened is that the privileged access has existed, but the logging and controls have not been good enough. And that wasn't investigated in too much detail in the Horizon trial so far. Um, There wasn't apparently the necessity, so I can understand that. But that's what you would expect to happen in a well-designed system, and that doesn't seem to have happened here. Now I'm going to I'm going to sound as though I, I, I well show I don't really know very much at all Stephen but would it always be Fujitsu people who have that um, privilege of the of access or could it be post office personnel who are hopefully properly trained I, I mean do they both have obviously Fujitsu has all you know lots of IT specialists but how many specialists do you think the post office had if any Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I don't think that detail was was gone into. If you're building a system like this, you can choose. So sometimes the the IT supplier, so Fujitsu in this case, um, could be set up to be the the single organization to have this special access to the system to to fix up problems. Sometimes it might be the customer. So in this relationship, it would be post office, and sometimes it's both. So it it depends how you design it. Um, but in whatever happens, the uh, design should say who should have access and what sh- they should be able to do. And that should be recorded somewhere, you'd think. There would be a, a, sta- a kind of document explaining that. Yes, um, there should be a document, and there, there probably was. Um, I didn't see that document being discussed, but what was discussed is an audit uh, performed and one of the audits flagged up the issue that this privileged access was not as well controlled as the auditors thought it should be. Yes, and that would be the auditors in the post office or auditors in yes. Fujitsu who. I think this was the the post office auditors flagged this up as a risk in Horizon. Yes, there was a problem with 
um, the post office getting enough information out of Fujitsu about the operation of the system, I believe. Uh, some risk, some it cost them something if they wanted the to get information. Yes, the, the, the flows of information between different parties was a very common issue in the Horizon trials. Um, so like, one example was the, the known error logs. So Fujitsu maintained a database of problems that they identified in the Horizon. This is what you'd expect from any well-maintained IT system. Um, but when the sub-postmasters asked for this document, they were told that the post office didn't have access to it. And then there was a long and expensive legal argument. And then finally, it transpired that post office did have the right to access this document. And then the document appeared. So yeah, the, the flows of information between different parties um, was quite poor. And I think that's one of the things that contributed to the miscarriages of justice and certainly contributed to the, the, the length and expense of these trials. If people were keeping a record of bugs and um, problems with Horizon, you'd think that the sub-postmasters would be, would, be, would be passing that information to the post office and the post office would pass it to Fujitsu rather than post, sub-postmasters directly contacting Fujitsu with uh, error logs or with, with bugs. In, in, other, in other words, the post office would know what bug information they'd passed on to Fujitsu. Even if they didn't have access to Fujitsu's logs, they'd know what they'd told Fujitsu about, presumably. Yeah, so um, identifying a bug as a user of a system is very hard. And so there's normally several tiers of support um, which will help users, in this case sub-postmasters, work out what's gone wrong. And in many cases, they can they can fix the problem at that stage. But at some point, the, that first level of support won't be able to fix it, and then it'll get escalated. And then eventually, for the most serious cases, it will end up at the desk of a programmer in Fujitsu who's got to look at the code and work out what's going on. So that's a fairly normal thing to happen. But what seems to have gone particularly wrong is that this information was collected, but then it wasn't disclosed in the... Um, disputes, whether civil or criminal, where it might have been the case, and it looks like in many cases it was, a bug that actually caused the shortfall rather than the sub-postmaster making a mistake or acting fraudulently. Stephen, what do you, I mean, if we sat in a room of IT specialists and they were told that courts and a lot of lawyers have no idea about what you're talking about, and actually believe that systems like you are describing now are effectively not going to produce the wrong uh, outcome, as it were. That they, they, they work, and there's, there's, that's just it. That seems to be the way that the legal profession and the the courts and everyone that um, has been involved in this case, um, in, in an actual way, representing people or dealing with people. What would you say about that? Yeah, I think there's relatively few um, technical specialists who have much interaction with the court system. Uh, there's there's expert witnesses. I do this occasionally. There's professional expert witnesses that deal with this on deal with this on a daily basis, and and they obviously know those those sorts of issues. But I think the majority of people working in technology don't realise the, the treatment of computers in the court system. So there's been articles published about the, the presumption that computers operate correctly. And that was the presumption that the post office could rely on in the prosecutions that they performed. And I think if you showed that to the, the average programmer, they would think this is laughable. They know that even the smallest, simplest program is inevitably going to have bugs. Uh, the hard part is identifying which bugs are going to be relevant uh, and which bugs are, are not going to be relevant. Most are probably not, but, but some are. And when you have enough people using a system to do enough um, transactions, Horizon is very complicated and it does a huge number of transactions, then very rare, rarely occurring bugs will actually appear um, quite often inside a, a country like, uh, like the United Kingdom. And I suppose they'd be horrified to think that people have actually gone to prison. I mean, it, it's it's not just a few mistakes have been made, it's people have been sent to prison. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, there's been terrible human cost from this. Um, and 
I think it, it should be a concern to any working anyone working technology that maybe the code that they're writing today will be used to send someone to jail for a crime that they didn't commit. Are you picking um, up any concern, Stephen, amongst? I mean, maybe you haven't had to give any expert evidence lately, but amongst the legal profession about about the consequences of that assumption of the infallibility of computer systems, are you picking up any any remorse or concern about that from lawyers? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, there's certainly uh, lawyers who are involved or at least um, have a special interest in the post office trial who are, are trying to do something about this. And I think you've, you've spoken to some of them. Um, in the, the wider community, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure um, whether this is happening. So I think probably the the, the vast majority of um, technical specialists will, will not know about this, or if they do, they'll say it's the legal system's fault. And then even within the, the, the legal and expert profession, there's some debate about what should be done. So... Um, Maybe this um, the presumption that uh, is not the right option, um, but equally you could say that it should be disclosure that should be improved. Um, if more information was disclosed in the trials, including the criminal prosecutions, about the errors that at the very least Fujitsu knew were in Horizon, then maybe this could have been avoided. Although it, it so, does sound as though courts yeah. made it difficult to mm. enforce disclosure, that, that um, evidence was asked for or information was asked for and, and it wasn't provided and that was allowed to go on. Yes, yeah. Um, so I think the questions that I hope will be asked in the inquiry is um, why did the Post Office Limited, acting as a prosecutor, not disclose this information? Because they did have a responsibility to do that. Uh, so why did this not appear? Is it because they couldn't find it? Is it because they didn't have it? Is it because they knew about it and then failed to disclose it? So uh, that's one issue uh, because Post Office Limited are the people who had this information probably and should have disclosed it if they had it. Um, But then there's the other issue that they didn't and then the request to disclose this information were were refused by the court. And some of that is because of the presumption, um, but some of it is also because uh, the, the court system doesn't seem to understand how computers work to... Um, a very, so, so what's your um, experience, Stephen, experience. when you're giving expert evidence to a court and you're trying to explain mm-hmm. these issues? Are you finding that people are interested, uh, that your evidence is, is uh, kind of alters people's attitudes, or are you finding that it's going over people's heads and they are reverting to uh, habit, perhaps, in the way they view computers? Yeah. So in the, the trials I've been involved in, um, the, the the judge or um, uh, and the lawyers are are working hard to try to understand what's actually gone on, but doing so in an environment of limited disclosure and a, a great deal of uncertainty. So I think they're they're trying hard, but these are are quite difficult questions to answer, uh, especially when not inf- not enough information about the computer system has been disclosed. So that's. That's one issue. There have been other cases that I haven't been involved in but seen reported when it does seem that the court system is very dismissive of people saying that computers have problems, even when uh, looking at the evidence, it was very likely that a computer problem contributed to to this case. So it probably varies between different people's experience, Um, sometimes very bad and, and sometimes okay, but not exactly a great situation. So, so there's nothing that you've heard about from the judiciary that they're clamouring for training or at least um, perhaps a lecture on their understanding of software because they've seen all of this going on about the post office. You would have thought it would have been just an enormous red light mm-hmm. that they might like mm-hmm. to you know, look at and, and try and improve their understanding, yeah. but you haven't heard anything like that. Mm-hmm. I've seen it to a very small extent. Um, a limited number of legal professionals of all sorts are interested in learning more about this and and are, are working hard to try to achieve that. But no, it's, it's not a, a, a huge issue, uh, it seems. And there are other areas of, of legal specialism um, where specialist judges have specialist training. 
and I think one of the things that was fortunate in the, the post office trial was that the judge there um, did have a lot of understanding of, of IT issues and, and worked very hard to understand these and explain them. Uh, so one possibility is that this should become another legal specialism. So you have to go to a special court um, when you're dealing with IT rules, but that increases costs and expense and causes delays. So maybe the argument is that this sort of issue is so common, that computer evidence is so common, that actually this should be based part of the basic training for all legal professionals going forward. But the, 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 the danger otherwise is that um, some people who do understand the system are able to get away with, uh, not murder maybe, but certainly fraud and uh, deception because they, uh, they're, what they've done can't, isn't understood by anybody. Yes. Yeah, that was the concern that caused the presumption that computers are operating correctly to be created. So it was um, a law commission inquiry into uh, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which required that computer evidence be accompanied by a certification that the computer was working correctly and had a few other rules. But the concern from the IT industry and, and also the legal profession was that uh, well-represented and uh, criminals could be um, Got, could get off with crimes, particularly fraud, by saying, well, the computer was wrong. And as a result, the, this uh, clause of Policing Criminal Evidence Act was removed, and that was what caused the presumption, the very problematic presumption, to come into place. So exactly because of that concern that you That's had. That's so fact. interesting. So it's a kind of un, unexpected consequence of trying to prevent fraud um, using computer. Yes, yeah, it's, it should have been it should have been expected. Um, I'm interested in what actually went on uh, in the discussions that caused this presumption to be created, and they've asked for some of the documents from the post office to so show what they were thinking at the time. Um, one possibility is that the IT experts that were advising the removal of the presumption wanted something better put in its place. And that was written in the reports that were submitted to the Law Commission. But that better thing never appeared. And so we had this fairly chaotic system where sometimes a, a judge will work very hard to work out what's going on. And sometimes they'll be very dismissive. And then you get very differing and sometimes very unfair legal outcomes. So were, were the post office or Fujitsu actually involved in the discussions about um, pushing forward this idea that computers are infallible? Uh, post office, definitely, yes. So they submitted something to the Law Commission which was supporting the repeal of this the cert certification scheme that previously existed. Um, I don't know the content of that letter. The post office don't have a record of it. So I've currently got a Freedom of Information request outstanding with the Law Commission to see if they can track this down. When you've got a system like this where, you know, presumably Fujitsu knew that there were bugs... The post office knew that there were bugs. The, the, the sub-postmasters are often completely out of their depth in dealing with the complexity of Horizon. There, there is a real opportunity for fraud. I mean, quite apart from the false allegations of fraud due to uh, malfunction of the software, there's, there are real opportunities for fraud there. If anybody who actually understood how poorly managed the system was, with, with millions of pounds passing through the system, um, do you think that's possible, that there was real fraud going on? Uh, probably. In, in any significant system, we are going to have a certain amount of fraud. Um, like in the, the banking system, um, it's not unusual for banks to fire 1% of their employees every year for committing fraud against the bank. This is just a, a cost of doing business. They, they build this into their profit margins. And yeah, probably with Horizon, there could have been fraud. Um, some might have been identified by the the post office. Um, some might not have been identified. Um, it's also possible that individuals who were committing fraud could claim that it was uh, not fraud and actually was down to bugs. And I think one of the reasons that the post office were so aggressive about prosecuting people was they were afraid about people exploiting this sort of bug loophole 
and I think that is why they were ended ended up with these um, prosecutions, which probably lost them money. That it's I could definitely believe that they spent more money prosecuting people than they ever uh, obtained by um, getting them to pay money back to the the post office. So it wasn't they wanted money back from the sub postmasters. Well, it probably was, um, but it was also because they didn't want any precedent. Um, not a legal precedent, but sort of informal precedent that people will be able to say that Horizon has bugs and therefore they should um, not be held responsibility for actual genuine fraud. And because that went wrong, we had to... So Stephen, how, how would it be possible for somebody who was successful to get, actually get their hands on the money? How, how would they do that? Because you can, you know, you can fiddle with the numbers, as it were, on a screen, but how do you actually get the cash... <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is it's really hard to do, and criminals know how to do this, but the, the average person in the street probably doesn't, and that's why I think this fear, um, which is also present in the banking system, that suddenly uh, people will become criminals just because they realise the system has bugged. Uh, I know the the number of people who are very clever with computers, um, manage to get some money out of the computer system, and then are caught later on down the line. Um, because moving money around in a way that is not traceable is not just a technical problem. So you, there's occasional stories of, um, of smart geeks um, managing to think they've been very clever in stealing some money, and then they get caught before they leave the, the door uh, of the, the bank where they try to withdraw the cash. So what people can do is try to trigger uh, some situation where it looks like money has um, uh, been paid out when it really hasn't been paid out and now that money is not being tracked and then you can take that cash and and walk away with it. But there's controls in there to prevent that. There's a a balancing operation that makes sure that every bit of money that's moved in matches every bit of money moving out. And it's during that balancing operation that these shortfalls were identified. And then the hard part is working out where this has gone wrong. So is the balancing operation gone wrong because of some computer error or really has money disappeared out of the system? Uh, so the, the trick would be to make the balancing operation look like it's correct. Even- so would it be fair to say that the postmasters and mistresses are the least equipped to have managed that. And I'm not meaning necessarily just in terms of their lack of understanding, but also their their inability to actually get into the, the software, as it were, and do anything with it to, to make it behave differently. Yeah. Uh, the Horizon was designed to protect itself from the sub-postmasters. So it wasn't a system run by sub-postmasters for them. It was a system run by post office to manage the branch, but also keep track of the sub-postmasters. And they were not in a good position of of tampering with things in a way that would allow them to take money. So um, if someone had access to this privileged access, um, which is used for fixing problems, then that would be a, a far more effective way about of taking money out of the system than the access that the sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses is given. Yes, the facilities that Horizon offered to sub-postmasters to work out what had actually happened in the branch were not very good. And so when there was a failure to balance, actually working out what had happened took a lot of effort. And in some cases, the uh, the sub-postmasters were able to work out what had gone wrong and they had a a good reason to believe it was a computer bug. Um, In other cases, they just didn't have the time or access or expertise to do so. And so they said, yes, everything is fine. And then it was precisely that statement that was being used as evidence against them for um, uh, claiming that they have committed fraud Um, because the, the legal claim was that, well, they agreed with these figures um, but during the Horizon trial, that idea um, was dismissed because they didn't actually have a choice. Um, it wasn't there was no way they could say, "Well, it doesn't quite balance." They had to say it balance, or the. Mm. And one of the things that the the sub postmasters describe is auditors visiting their branch when there's a problem. They said auditors would visit their branch, and the auditor would sit down with the terminal, and do something. And it wasn't at all clear what 
what that was, because there's there's a difference between what seemed to have been happening in these sub post offices when the auditors visited like that, and what you're talking about in terms of auditing a computer system to see if it's functioning properly. Did, were they auditors, or were they? How would you compare the auditing that they were doing in the sub post offices with what you would expect to see auditing of a system? Uh, so those are that's the the same term being used in in two quite different ways. Um, this often happens in 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 computing that computing borrows a term from some other field. So conventionally, auditing is a, a financial thing. So um, a financial audit makes sure that money has not disappeared. Um, in a computer, the an audit log is a set of um, entries which show what has happened to a computer system. And then from that, you can see who has done what um, and with what authorization have they done it. So they are vaguely fitting in the same thing. You're, it's a, a record used to prevent bad things happening, but they're, they're actually quite different and probably professional auditors will be quite upset about me using it in the computer science term. So the people visiting sub postmasters probably weren't going through the computer um, p- process in that detail that you're talking about as a computer audit? No, they're, they're looking at the, f- the financial records and then trying to see if there was any mistakes or evidence of fraud. Um, the other set of records is there to protect the computer system from people with privileged access. So, um, per- say it should be allowed in some cases that someone can go in and fix up a, a problem that has been created by a computer bug. That, that bugs are inevitable. These will cause errors in the data and something needs to be uh, fixed about that. But any sort of access is quite dangerous because if there's a mistake made or there is a malicious action made in this operation, then you can quite easily steal money or at least make it um, do the first step of stealing money and so that's why you have these special controls and sometimes the controls are there before you have access so unless you type in this password you can't do anything Um, but sometimes the controls happen afterwards so you can go in and fix the problem because maybe it's uh, urgent but then later on that day someone senior will come in and make sure that everything you have done is exactly to fix the problem nothing how how is that achieved is that is that a a record made by the computer of all the keystrokes you make when you're using your privileged access or is it some other kind of way of recording what you've done by kind of interviewing you and just asking you how's that how would that normally be done so it is the computer recording steps. Normally it's not the keystrokes made. So normally it is um, a, a record of actions. So when you're building a computer system, um, one of the things that is common to put in is that before any important action, an entry is written to a file to say what is being done and who is doing it. And that file is the audit log. So um the, the audit log is created by the same program which is actually doing the changes. And it tries to make sure that it never makes a change without adding something into this log and making sure that that log never gets tampered with. That sounds like it's just part of the normal software structure. Uh, if it's built in, that's part of the normal structure. But if you forget to add this in or you, you make some mistakes, then uh, this sort of thing will, will not happen. So what seems to have happened is the fact that someone logged in to do some privileged action was recorded, but exactly what they did did not get recorded. How, how long do those records normally last, Stephen, when, when, when you know, these kind of audit logs? How long, do, how long does it get kept? Yeah. Um, so this is something that the, the operator gets to decide. So uh, sometimes it's basically forever. Um, but sometimes they do have a regular rotation. So every, say, seven years, they, um, they th- well, so every year they throw out everything that's more than seven, seven years old or something like that. So once they believe that there's no, likely to be no more disputes about this, then, then they get rid of it. So what, do, what would you say, Stephen, to somebody who might be thinking, well, look, this is just the post office and Fujitsu. Uh, it's a one-off. 
um, you know, just a very unusual thing, terrible to have happened, but... Particularly sloppy management, yes, for example. Yes, but it couldn't happen anywhere else or it's very unlikely. What would you, what would you say about that? Yeah, I, I think this is definitely a bad case, certainly in the, the scale that's happened. There are some unique properties of this case which have contributed it to it being so problematic. And one is that the post office itself were acting as prosecutors rather than there being a, a truly independent prosecutor carrying this out. So that is something special. But a lot of the other characteristics of this could easily be replicated. Horizon definitely had very serious bugs and these bugs did cause apparent shortfalls that were used to send innocent people to jail. But from a, the perspective of an IT project, Horizon was relatively successful. A third of IT projects never actually make it to being deployed in full. So the fact that Horizon went forward and actually is being used now puts it in the, the top two thirds of IT projects. And the fact that it didn't lose massive amounts of money for the, the post office, again, shows that from a business perspective, Horizon fulfilled many of its roles. And compared to other projects, I think there'll be um, other systems that have just as many bugs, but are accepted as being good enough for the business. The problem is that being good enough for a business does not mean good enough to prosecute people or even good enough to uh, use as evidence in civil trials. And I think that's a, the mistake. So uh, often a computer system is considered good enough and analysed to be good enough for one business purpose. And then that is taken to mean that it's now beyond question when it comes to legal disputes. And that's not the case. And the fact that the presumption exists in law that allows that sort of argument to be made could allow this to happen again. And one example, I think, is in uh, payment disputes. If someone has money disappear from their bank account, the banks will often say that, well, our computer system is robust, just like post office um, argued. It, sometimes that might be true, but other cases, it could be through malicious access to the banking system, or it could be through errors in the banking system that this money has disappeared and it's not the customer's fault. And are now they being treated in the same way by the banks? Are they being told that, you know, you're not going to get your money back because we don't believe that this is a problem of ours, this is a problem of yours? Yes, um, not quite in the same way. So where this comes up is someone has money disappeared from their account, they go to the, the bank and then they ask for the money bank and the bank says no. And sometimes, a rare number of cases, they go to court and then they have a, a similar situation. But that's a, a civil dispute. It's very rare for banks to actually prosecute their, um, their customers. Finally, Stephen, because we're running out of time, what what's the thing for us to look out for now in, in terms of what, what are the problems that you're hearing about that people are encountering that we should be alert to? Uh, I think if anyone ever says that computers are infallible, um, then that's definitely something to raise a, a red flag about. But then what can we do about it? So can we um, change this uh, presumption? of correctness of computer evidence. I think probably we should, but what should it be replaced by? I think that's not so clear. And then the, the other challenge is how do we build more technical expertise within the legal profession? Not necessarily to answer all these questions, but at least knowing when to stop and then bring in experts. Uh, I think that would be the, the level of competence that um, I would hope the legal profession could develop to prevent this sort of thing happening again. In the that's very sensible. And... Um... I wonder if it'll happen, because <coughs> uh, there's a silence at the moment from the judiciary. Yes, I, I'm, my optimistic way of looking at it is that things move slowly. So the the post office horizon IT inquiry might raise some of these questions. I've certainly suggested that this is an important thing they should look at. The Law Commission have a pre-consultation where they've asked, should they ask this question? Um, I hope the answer is yes, and then we can see what answers they can come up with. So things are gradually happening. Um, I, I hope it will be quick enough.